Anyhow, we're into the Word, and if you're a guest with us today, we're in a series working through 1 Samuel. And what I want to tell you is that we're in 1 Samuel chapter 8, is that Christ is hidden, I believe, almost in every page of Scripture. And if we just look around in there, we will find Him. And we're going to find Him today, and we're going to see who He is and how He responds. If we respond negatively, how that turns out. So as we again, uh, if you're a guest, you don't understand what we're about to do, but I give the church about 30 seconds each week before I teach and preach, and my style is more of a teaching style. But I give them 30 seconds to pray for yourselves, to pray that the Lord will open your hearts, your minds, your ears, uh, your spirits, to hear the Word of God and to allow it to come to convict, to challenge, and to change. Amen? And then to pray that the Word of God, as it comes in this expression to be explained by me that I would do so biblically and in the power of the Holy Spirit that all of us would know that we have met with God this day. So with that, if you would take the hand of a neighbor or maybe you don't like to hold hands with somebody you don't really know, that's okay. But if you wouldn't mind taking that 30 seconds, church, and just praying for the time of the word, and then I'll close that part and we will begin. So if you would start, 30 seconds right now. Father, we thank you for the gift of your Son, Jesus Christ. And we thank you for the gift of the Word of God. So many over the centuries have tried to destroy it and wipe it out from the face of the earth. But your promise is true that it will always be here to the very end, that they'll never be able to get rid of it. And we thank you, for It is our guide in understanding you, understanding ourselves, and understanding our world. So be with us now, we pray. Anoint us to hear and to speak in Jesus' name. And all of God's people said, Amen. Amen. As we begin, I want to explain a little bit about uh, this passage in, Deut- uh, in uh, 1 Samuel 8. It's the beginning of the point of the fulfillment of a prophecy that came to uh, Israel in Deuteronomy chapter 17, verse 14 through 15. So if you have your Bibles, I always love it when you turn to your Bibles and start marking them. I know the The easy way is to take it off of the screen behind me, but I think it's better if you're working in your own Bibles to get you a point of reference, and you'll remember where it is later on when you're looking. But in in Deuteronomy chapter 17, verse 14, it reads this way. When you come to the land which the Lord your God is giving you and possess it and dwell in it, now they're not even there yet, and I will set and, and say, I will set a king over me like all the nations that are around me, you shall surely set a king over you whom the Lord your God chooses. One from among your brethren you shall set as king over you. You may not set a foreigner over you who is not your brother, but he shall not, mul- but, <laughs> pardon me, uh, he shall not multiply horses for himself, nor cause the people to return to Egypt to multiply horses. For the Lord has said to you, you shall not return that way again. So just reading that to let you know that way back prior to this passage in Samuel, the promise of a king and the promise of a kingdom was coming. Now we're going to look at this today from the idea of the historical political kingdom of Israel and also the spiritual, but we're going to relate it in a sense as we listen that it can be for us too because we are kingdom people today. Amen? Where's the kingdom of God? It dwells within you. Jesus said the kingdom of God is within you. So we are already part of the kingdom. And the kingdom we are part of is not a political kingdom. It is a spiritual kingdom. Now, because it's spiritual, it has ramifications in every other kingdom in our lives. But we want to understand here that what God is about is bringing about the fulfillment of his prophecy. And yet the Israelites throw him a curve And he's ready for that curve. He understands it when we throw him, you know, a really bad shot, but he can deal with it. But we're going to look at it and see. So what's happening now, he's establishing his kingdom. 
and the kingdom in Israel, but not the whole kingdom of God as we think of it today. And starting at chapter 8 and moving all the way to the end of Samuel, which has 31 chapters, you will see that this is the story of the establishment of the kingdom of Israel. You will also see that it is the tale of two kings. It's the tale of the king Saul, who starts out well and ends horribly. And it is the beginning of the movement of the anointed one, who is David, who suffers throughout much of his kingship, waiting to become the coronated king. He is not yet coronated, but anointed. But most of this book will deal essentially with the fall and the demise of King Saul. So today we begin looking at this whole program. What we want to do is start with verse 1 through 3. If you're a guest, you'll note as we do this, I read and then I comment. So re reading from 8, 1 through 3. Now it came to pass when Samuel was old that he made his sons judges over Israel. Somebody had to have some control there. The name of his firstborn was Joel and the name of his second Abijah. They were judges in Beersheba. But his sons did not walk in his ways. They turned aside after dishonest gain, took bribes, and perversed or perverted justice. So what we see in this thing is although they were appointed judges and although they grew up in a godly home, these young men became corrupt. We don't know why they chose to go that way. We know that their father was not. Samuel was a great prophet. He was highly ethical and stable in his relationship with both God and man. He never compromised. He always stood his ground in the things of the kingdom. But these young men had become corrupt. They had begun to take bribes, and they were judges. They had closed their eyes to justice and to truth. And because they closed their eyes, they were also, as it were, closing their hearts, not only to justice, not only to the people, but also to God. So they were not a good example of what God was attempting to do in the bringing forth of his kingdom and the caring for his people. But what takes place in all this is that I think it helps us understand as parents that sometimes you can do everything right, or at least you attempt to do everything right, and you will have a child that just goes and turns left on you. Anybody here ever experienced that? I know we have. And I'm your pastor and so on and so forth, but my life is not perfect either. And Shirley and I have invested in our family and so on and so forth, but we've had kids that go wayward, wayward for a time. We hope not wayward for a lifetime, but it happens. And what causes that? There's a great mystery. And I know when a, when a parent's child goes off the rails, as I call it, there's a lot of opportunity for parental shame, parental sorrow, grief, uh, misery, all of those things. And the question always comes, what could I have done differently? What should I have done differently? What could I have done better? And some of those questions may be legitimate, but I want to say this. Children have free will. You can invest everything you've got into them and they can still go against the way of God. We pray that they don't because it's misery when they do. But if you look in the Old Testament, you see it over and over again. A godly king raises a son, and that son becomes a reprobate. But he's the king. And then that reprobate son who becomes a king has children, and his son becomes a godly man. And you see it going back and forth all the time. A godly man, a reprobate son, a reprobate father, and a godly son. It's strange. It's odd. It's peculiar. But I say this as we start this passage just because it's here. And I want you as parents, as I need to hear it as a parent, that sometimes things just don't turn the way that we would like. Shirley once said to me many, many years ago, because I was really struggling over some of the defeat in our family. And she said, John, don't forget that Adam had a perfect father. Pretty good, eh? Pretty good. That hit me like a ton of bricks, and they were all gold. It was like, wow, she's right. I can understand that. And so this passage is not here to condemn Samuel, but it brings us into an introduction of what happens when there is failure, and especially failure at the upper echelon in the leadership of a nation or a people. So now we're ready for verse 4 and 5. Let's go to verse 4 and 5. Chapter 8, 1 Samuel. Then all the elders of Israel, they'd had enough. They gathered together and came to Samuel at Ramah and said to him, Look, you are old and your sons do not walk in your ways. And I don't think they were real polite about it. 
Now make us a king to judge us like all the nations. Now, do you remember I read in Deuteronomy that God said they would do this very thing? And I think in some degree, they're going back and they're thinking, we know that scripture. We know what that is. So now's the time. Do it now. Set a king over us that we can be like all of the other nations. That's a very dangerous place to be when we want to be like everybody else. Turn with me to Proverbs chapter 29 and verse 2. Proverbs 29 and verse 2. It reads in this fashion, When the righteous are in authority, the people rejoice. But when a wicked man rules, the people groan. So what's going on here? These people have had their fill of it. And now they're becoming impatient. They're wanting what they want, which is relief. How many of us, when we're in the trouble, we want relief? Amen? You get that diagnosis you don't like. You understand you've got to have this surgery. You see that your kid's going off the rails, whatever it may be, and you just want relief. You want a break from the whole thing. And when that happens, we become vulnerable. We become more and like we become more and more likely to fall into a bad decision. And that's what's happening here. These people are beginning to act in very rash ways. They're not responding to God intellectually, spiritually, and logically. They're not coming to God and saying, Lord God, is this the time? Remember when the disciples asked Jesus, when will you establish the kingdom of God? He says, it's not for you to know. When will you be coming back? Well, that's not for you to know. And so here they are. They're beginning to push God. They're beginning to pressure the man of God, who is Samuel, and say, you need to do something about this situation. Saints, I will tell you. There are times when you're not supposed to do something about a situation. Amen? That didn't sound like most of you believe that. <laughs> are there times when you're not supposed to do anything about a situation? Yes. Amen. Now we got it. It's hard. It's rough because we want out of this. We want the pressure gone. But sometimes it's in the crucible of that fire. It's in the fire of that pain and that difficulty that the real stuff that God is after is being produced. Amen? Peter writes it to us. This is a different sermon than the first sermon of the first service. It always is. Peter writes to us that we are, we are being uh, refined in, in the fire of God. In the fire of the Holy Spirit, Jesus talks about he's coming and his winnowing fan is in his hand. And he's going to come and he's going to separate the chaff and fire is going to burn it up. When we run into these tough situations, saints, sometimes God is burning out the chaff. Sometimes he's bringing on the heat so the impurities will float to the top and he'll skim that off and be done with it in Jesus Christ. So we have to understand that here. So these corrupt leaders had created some issues and they had caused great harm to Israel because now Israel has become impatient and they're, they're discouraged and they're demanding a solution to this situation, no matter what the solution may be. And then they say, we want to be like other nations. How many of us can remember as young children when we were growing up, especially in our teen years, did you want to stand out anywhere? No. You wanted to be like everybody else. Cut my hair the same, you know, same kind of clothes and so on. And God bless my parents. They wouldn't let me do that. They said, Johnny, you are an individual. Be an individual. And I said, well, I want to dress like them. I said, well, we're buying your clothes and we can't barely afford the ones we got. You're going to have to be an individual. It's okay. But you see, the rest of the world wants to chase after all of those things. And then we find that Christians want to do the same thing. Our young people today are hard pressed to be like everybody else. And then when you talk to them, they say, oh, I'm being myself. No, they're not. They're cheap copies of something else. And it's usually not very good. James chapter 4 verse 4 tells us that if we want to be like the world and be friends with the world, we will be at enmity with God. That means we'll become enemies of God. Listen to it. It says it like this. Uh, Do you not know that friendship with the world is enmity with God? Whoever therefore wants to be a friend of the world makes himself an enemy of God. If your tastes are following the world, watch out. You may be actually becoming an enemy of the living God. And note this when I say these things, saints. God loves all human beings. He loves everyone, but not everyone will respond to that love. But He does love everyone. 
That's why he gave his son, because he is not willing that any should perish, but that all should come to repentance. Amen? But the reality is we get to choose. God is in love with you. Did you know that? He is in love with a pure, raw, pagan heathen. He's in love with them. But they won't respond to his love. They want what they want, the way they want it, when they want it. The church should never be that way. You know, we're finding in, in the churches of the modern society today, many of them are becoming as much like the world as they can get so that the world will come to them. It doesn't change anything. Now, I'm not trying to be rude and crude and socially unacceptable just to be rude and crude and socially unacceptable. But I'm trying to follow the Lord. And if that offends people, it does. But I find most of the time if they see it happening and it's real and it's ethical and it's not religious, they respond positively to it. I was speaking with one of the brothers in the second first service this morning. And he told the story. He's talking to a man where he was working. And the guy was talking about the evolution and everything else. And, and this individual answered, this is just this morning. He says, I just told him, well, I know the God who made it all. He began to talk about who God is. He said, this 72-year-old man broke down in front of him at work and began to weep and to cry and receive Jesus Christ as Lord and Savior. Amen? I won't tell you who the brother is because I don't want it going on the radio, but you all know him. He's a great man in Christ Jesus. He wasn't going anywhere with him. He said, well, I just know the truth. Boom, and there it was. So you see, when you try to be like the world, you ruin your own life and you shoot the problem for the rest of them too because they can't see the difference. Saints, they need to see the difference. Amen? And because the people of Israel could not see the difference in the sons of Samuel, they began to say, well, it doesn't matter. Let's become like the world. Give us a, a king that rules us like the other nations have. We're supposed to have one king. And what's his name? Jesus. Say that again. Jesus. Now it sounds like you mean it. That's who it is. And he's the king of your hearts today. It's not when you die and go to heaven. He's supposed to be king for us today. And you see, because of the bad leadership, the corruption there, the people became discouraged and they began to do great harm to themselves as they began to pursue solutions outside of the will of God. Did they have a prophecy? Yes, they did. But now they weren't waiting for God's timing on the prophecy. That's radically important, saints. If God tells you he's going to do something, trust us. Trust him. He will do it but let him do it in his time. Every time man tries to fulfill the prophecies of God, it never works out right. Let us think of Brother Abraham, okay? Father Abraham, all these sons. But he started out with the right track, and then he decided, I'm going to make this happen. And here we have today brothers fighting one another and about to bring the world into a world war. And it will happen one day because these two brothers are never going to make peace. Not really. It's not going to happen. And that's because one man named Abraham decided, well, I can get this done. You know, I'm getting old. I got to get this taken care of. God said I'd have it. I'll make it happen. Doesn't work like that. When God makes a promise, he keeps the promise. Everybody say it. When God makes a promise, he keeps the promise. Keep that in your minds consciously before you. And don't be concerned about anything but knowing the way of God. Don't choose to be like everybody else. And don't put the rush on God. Don't put your security in human beings. Proverbs 14, 12 tells us that there is a way which seems right to a man, but the end thereof is death. When you look at the story of King Saul, what a tragedy it becomes. Because they were going the way of man. He was handsome. He was taller than everybody else. He was big-shouldered, but he wouldn't face Goliath. Guess who did? 17-little-year-old squirt, been anointed by God, went out and took him down, and later took down his brothers as well. You see, it's not about your position. It's about your relationship with Jesus Christ. And that's what David had over and above, head and shoulders above King Saul. So don't rush God and don't try to make demands on God. We do that to our, to our peril. Don't make demands on God. And what do I mean by that? Sometimes we tell God what we want and God, you better do it. You ever prayed one like that? I have. <laughs> Not a good outcome with those. I stopped that long ago because it never worked out. 
the way that it should. In fact, one of the areas of weakness in my life was I made demands of God about ministry. And man, I wanted fruit. Boy, there were leaves over here, fruit over there, all of this. But you know what? You couldn't see Jesus anymore. There was so much fruit that wasn't God's fruit hanging on my tree that you couldn't see Jesus Christ in me if you tried. Because I was more interested in the fruit and the programs and the process rather than abiding in Jesus Christ. I've been teaching my men about this. If you want to be purposeful, if you want to be fruitful in your lives, saints, and I mean fruitful to a point that it lasts all the way into eternity and as far as eternity goes, which is forever, abide in Jesus Christ. Your first purpose is to abide in Christ. Your first purpose is to know Him. And then you become a fruit hanger. The sap flows through you from the vine, and the fruit begins to be produced. But the fruit that is of God and not your own. That's the power of abiding in Jesus Christ. In fact, the shorter catechism, the Westminster, Cate Westminster Catechism. How many of you guys know about what catechisms are? Not catacombs, but catechisms. Catechisms were a, were a set of questions that were uh, set up for people who were pursuing entrance into a church. And they wanted to make sure that their theology was good and their understandings were right about Scripture. I think we ought to do that today myself, but good luck. But anyway, the very first question is, in the first, well, in the shorter catechism is, what is the purpose of man? The answer will blow you away. The answer is to glorify or to worship God and to enjoy Him forever. Nothing about works. Not there. Your purpose, saints, if you get that right, you'll get everything else right. If you get your purpose right by abiding in Jesus Christ, everything else falls into place. Amen? Amen. It's kind of like, it's like a football player. And, and if a football player knows how to do the fundamentals, and he can do those in, in his sleep, just do them over and over and over and over again, then all the rest of his game begins to come together. If he understands how to throw a good block, if he understands all of those kinds of fundamentals that are essential to the game, that's what God is saying. Know the fundamentals. Be attached at a deep level to Jesus Christ, and you and I and we will not make the mistakes that Israel made. Because we don't want to pursue the world. If you pursue Jesus Christ and you truly abide in the vine as a branch of God, as a branch connected to Him, your lives will be amazing. I have never met anybody, anybody, who's really connected to Jesus Christ that would ever say to me, Lordy, this man, John, this Christian life is so boring. I have never heard it. Never, when I've seen someone radically committed to Jesus Christ, boring is not in their vocabulary. And I don't care if they're 90, I don't care if they're 9. As they're walking with Jesus Christ, they begin to see miracles all around them. And I don't mean these big karoom type miracles. All those, those may happen. I've seen some of those. But they'll see the miracle of life every day unfolding before them, seeing all of their difficulties, all of their issues, and all God's children's got issues. Everybody say, all God's children got issues. But they'll see them falling one by one like dominoes as Jesus Christ continues to be the Lord of their lives. Amen? That's what Israel was missing. They were relying upon Samuel. They were relying upon his sons. And now they're going to rely upon a king and not the king that God would really want which was going to be ultimately represented by David and then ultimately provided in Jesus Christ. So make the purpose of your life to glorify God. That means to live a holy and pure and righteous life filled with faith. Make the purpose of your life to glorify God and to enjoy Him forever. We as the Christians should be some of the happiest people in the world. We shouldn't be wandering around pouting and looking like we're weaned on a pickle. We should be the people who are saying, I trust in Jesus Christ. 
Yes, I've got pain. I've got difficulty. I've got disappointments. I've got water in the boat. But I've also got Jesus in the boat with me. That's what we need. Do you have Jesus in your boat? Come on, do you? That's the essential part. Keep him in the boat. Now, verses 6 through 18, it's a long read. I won't read it all to you, but let's jump in there right quick. But the things displeased Samuel when they made this request. When they said, give us a king to judge us. So Samuel prayed to the Lord. The Lord said to Samuel, heed the voice of the people in all that they say to you. Can you imagine? Heed the voice that they say to you. That wasn't what Samuel wanted to hear. Amen? I had a situation years and years ago, a staff member came in and, and offered me some ultimatums quite a number of years ago. Doesn't impact you guys, but it's a good story. He comes in and he sits down and gives me an ultimatum. I'm a senior pastor. He gives me an ultimatum. You will do these six things or I'm quitting. I said, can I, can I have a week to pray about this? Yes, you may. I said, okay, thanks. God spoke to me in five days. In the fifth day, I, I kneeling before the Lord and praying. And I said, well, Lord, what would you have me do? He says, heed his voice, do everything he says. What? Lord, this is ridiculous. I'm the boss. He says, do everything he says. I said, wait, wait a minute. Wait a minute. Why would I do that? He says, just do it and you will know. I won't tell you the end of the story, but it worked out beautifully for everyone involved, even that one man, because God had a better plan that I couldn't see. Have you ever gone to God and asked him for an answer to something that wasn't the answer you want? Ooh, those are the answers that are really, really good, but they don't feel good at the moment. Amen? Yeah. Say, it don't feel good at the moment. <clears throat> amen. Now, wait a minute. Got to get a good amen? Yeah. All right, now you're going. Okay, so the reality is Samuel goes. He talks to the Lord. The Lord says, heed what they say. They haven't rejected you, Samuel. They're rejecting me. And I don't think God even likes saying that. He doesn't want his people to reject him. Correct? He doesn't want us rejecting him. Not because he can't handle rejection, but because he knows what our rejecting of him means to us. What the outcome of that is going to be in our lives. He says, you go ahead and, and heed their voice and let me tell you why. And he says, all this time, they rejected me that I should not reign over them according to all the works which they have done since the day that I brought them up out of Egypt, even to this day with which they have forsaken me and served other gods. So they are doing to you also. Now, therefore, heed their voice. Listen to this. He's telling them, he's telling Samuel the history. He says, since they came out of Egypt, they were not following me. They don't want me to reign over their lives. What he's saying is, this is no short-term problem, folks. This is not a one-time deal. I made a choice, and I wish I hadn't made it, and I'll never make it again. This is a, a lifestyle. This is something they have chosen over and over and over and over to do. He says, so they're just going to keep going this way. Let's heed their, their voice, and they're going to learn a lesson through this whole thing. And they did. But he says, when you do that, I want you to warn them of the consequences. And so he did. I won't take time to read that to us today. But Samuel spoke to them the consequences that this king would have. And every single one, plus many more, took place. And Israel was practically destroyed because of the godless reign of King Saul. King Saul started really well, but he ended very badly. And so there's a message there for us. Listen for what God says. When you ask to hear it, listen. And when you hear it, it's going to shock you sometimes. It's not what you expect. But it's okay. Because God knows far more than you and I will ever dream of knowing. And he has your best in his heart. That's what he wants. And so it's, we see here as we read on, I won't take the time, but the, continue, the people continually persisted in their resistance to God and they did not want his reign over them. Now, here's the, here's, the, here's the kicker. This is the one you want to hear. They lost all their privilege. They lost their nation in many ways, and we know were thrown out of their own land for 2,000 years and have come back. They still do not want his reign, as we would call it today. But let's bring it down home. Let's look at the pieces of that, and they're simply this. Do you want Christ to reign in your life? And we can very quietly and 
and uh, without much reflection say, oh, yes. But I suspect that many times we don't. That we have all these different things that we want. We want to be like the world. We want to have another king other than Jesus. And maybe we've surrendered a great deal of our lives to the Lord, but we know inside our hearts there's something different that no one else knows about that I have not yet yielded to the kingship of Jesus Christ. That's what I want you to do today. I want you to say, Lord Jesus, I want everybody that can think of anything in their lives, if there's just one thing, if just one thing changes today, we've won. And that is to say, Lord, I've got this one thing. I just, I'm not ready to let you reign. I want it my way. I want to do it when I want to do it, why I want to do it, what I want to do. That's a heartbreak to God, believe it or not, and it's misery to you. And so the question for us, each one, is will we give up whatever it takes to have victory in our lives, or at least victory in that one area, to allow Jesus Christ once again to reign? It's a very important aspect of our Christian experience. I think of the story that Jesus told of the man who was out walking in the field and he discovered a great treasure. He quickly covered it up again and he ran off and he purchased that field. He gave everything he had to buy the greatest treasure of all. You see, if you have Jesus Christ, you are wealthy beyond measure. If we have Jesus Christ, we have treasure here, here, and on in the heavens with God himself, here, here, and there. So I ask you the question, have you found the treasure? And if you've found the treasure, have you owned it? Have you gone out and taken everything that's in your way and in your life that keeps you from opening all the riches of that treasure? Have you taken them and rid yourself of them, given them over to God so that you can walk in a way that brings glory to God so you can glorify Him and then you really enjoy Him? forever. That's what God offers to us, and that's what these stories are all about. He's showing us both the right way to do it at times, and other times He shows us the wrong way. Israel is showing us the wrong way. And I'm telling you that our King is Jesus Christ. Our treasure is Jesus Christ. Our help is Jesus Christ. Our hope is Jesus Christ. Our strength is Jesus Christ. Our Ebenezer is Jesus Christ. He's everything to us. And yet we'll keep as much of our own stuff as we possibly can so that we'll be like all these other people and never be a testimony to them nor bring any glory to our Father. This is what's in the Old Testament. Jesus hidden. When Samuel went and spoke to the Lord, he heard. Who do you think he heard? He heard. Jesus Christ, because the Father does not speak with lips, but Jesus conveyed that truth to him. Jesus is calling us as a people, as individuals, to surrender whatever we have to purchase that great treasure which is in that field. Amen? Amen. Father, we thank you for this day. We thank you for the power of the Word of God. Lord, it is so rich and so full. And I pray right now as the shepherd of this church that each of us would take a moment and weigh ourselves before you and say, Lord, show me an area. Some of us probably already know it. That I have broken and I cannot seem to overcome. Something that I want to get rid of, but I want to keep. Give each one of us a revelation of that. And then, Father, as well, give each one of us the power in Jesus Christ to surrender it and to take the treasure that you offer us. I pray, O oh Lord, that we each one would surrender our hearts fully to Jesus Christ and really realize our purpose, not just recognize, but realize our purpose is to know you and then all the remaining will find its own way out. I thank you, Lord, for this people. I pray that your spirit would take this message deep into their hearts, into their psyche, and that they would understand what has been said and what you are saying. Bless them this day, I pray, Father. 
in the name of Jesus Christ. And all of God's people said, Amen. Amen. Lord bless you.